right? If I have a study that if someone will remind me, I will, I guess we can put it into a chat or share a link with it so that we can go over, you can go over this material again in a written form. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version of the Bible and follow along with in whichever version that you use. And um, before we get into the Word of God, um, I thought, well, let's just do kind of a brief introduction to the book that we're going to study. The book of Hebrews, I believe, was written by the Apostle Paul. People contest that, but the spirit of prophecy indicates that it was Paul. And the logic that flows through it sounds very Pauline to me. The Apostle Paul was a very gifted individual. God blessed him with great wisdom, as the Apostle Peter said. And his books often work in, they'll start with theology, and then the second half of his book will be practical application, like what he wants you to do about it. And the book of Hebrews is similar to that. Now, of course, it was written to Hebrew believers in Jesus. And to understand what was going on at that time, it wasn't popular if you were a Jew to believe in Jesus. There was a lot of pressure being put on you by the non-believing Jews. And at the very same time, there was also pressure that you would face from the pagan Romans, from the Gentiles. And so if you were a Hebrew believer in Jesus, you were kind of isolated because you didn't fit in with the non-believing Jews anymore. They would persecute you. They would make things difficult for you. And there was also tension that could exist with Rome and with the Gentiles as you were in this kind of no man's land. And so when you're in a position where you're facing pressure from both sides, it can be really easy to compromise with one side so that, you know, as they say, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Y'all ever heard that? Oh, yes. So there could be a pressure to capitulate and go back to the old forms of the Jewish religion, which would be a denial of Christ. And so the book of Hebrews is written as an encouragement to the Hebrew Christians to persevere in their faith with Jesus. And because everything that they have with Jesus is better, right? It's a theme of the book. They have a better sacrifice. They have a better mediator. They have a better sanctuary. They have a better covenant. They have a better promise. They, everything that they have in Christ is better. And this is good for us to read and know too, right? Because sometimes it can be difficult looking in faith to the better reward that we're going to have. We can get distracted by everything down here on the earth. And so Hebrews helps and it reminds us of this better thing to come, right? And it puts our faith on Jesus and it directs us to go to the heavenly sanctuary. And so this is just dynamic, awesome, good stuff, right? So with that done, let's get into it. Now, how do you guys want to do this? Would everyone like to take turns reading or would certain per people want to read? You tell us how you want it, sir. Okay. Well, if there's anybody who would like to read, just raise your hand and let's read these verses together. And if there's no uh, volunteer, then I'll take the verses. And I'll begin with Hebrews chapter one, and I'm going to go down to verse four. And again, I'm reading in the New King James Version of the Bible. And after the reading, I'll just explain a few things and make draw out a few points. The Bible says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself 
purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Now, this is just potent. There is so much stuff in these little four verses that we could probably spend hours just digging into this one section. Okay. Uh, to begin with, who is the first person that is named there? Verse one, it begins with the word what? God. God. And who, who is this? the father this is clearly the father and we know that because he's differentiated from the next person that is mentioned in verse two which is who his son his son right now in the spirit of prophecy testimony treasures uh volume three page 266 we read this the scriptures clearly indicate the relation between god and christ and they bring to view as clearly the personality and individuality of each. God is the father of Christ. Christ is the son of God. To Christ has been given an exalted position. He has been made equal with the father. All the counsels of God are opened to his son. And we could actually tie this into Revelation, right? Where Remember Revelation 1 says the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him, right? So God is giving these revelation. In fact, Sister White says of Christ that he is the great trustee of divine revelation. And we're seeing that same point brought out here in Hebrews chapter 1. And I want to draw something out through these verses if you look at them closely they actually appear to present a linear sequence of progression with respect to the son of god and it focuses on three basic stages right his pre-existence then his incarnation right and that would include his earthly ministry and then his ascension let's let's go back and look at at the passage looking at verse two right and this is where we're going to see the linear sequence it says has in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he has what appointed heir of all things okay that's actually going to be the first event this is actually related to him being God's son, that he is the heir. He's the only begotten son of God, which means he is the rightful heir of all things that belong to God. And then what, what is said next? After it says he's the appointed heir, what does it say? By whom he also made the worlds. By whom also he made the worlds, or the Greek yeah. word there could also be translated as the ages. Okay, it's aeons. Okay, your new King James, instead of saying by, said something else, though. What does this say? It says through whom. Uh, same, okay. same point, a little semantic difference, but whether it's through or by, the point is that the Son is the agency whereby the Father created the ages, whereby he created the worlds. So we're seeing Christ is the appointed heir. We're seeing that the Father made the worlds or the ages through him. So that's the second event. And then there is a description of the Son in verse 3, right? This is actually present tense. It describes the Son as the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person or his substance, okay? And then we read what comes next. It says there in verse 3 that he upholds all things by the word of his power. So this is now the third event, and this comprehends his past activity and his present activity as the Son exalted back to his glory. And let's keep reading, because then it says, When he had by himself purged our sins. And when was that? When did Jesus purge our sins? 
on the cross. Right. So you can well, you see scripture actually tells us it was from the foundation of the world just manifested later. So it was all there to be done, but the carrying out of it was done at the cross. Yes. Well, well, you we can speak of Christ prophetically. Like, for example, the, the scripture will call him the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, right? But if Christ did not actually come and die at Calvary, then that prophecy would be unfulfilled. So, so we have the prophetic sort of description, but then we have the reality which happens at this given point in time. So Christ, this is moving forward through the linear events. This would be, it comprehends his incarnation and his, his death at Calvary when he died to pay the penalty for our sins. And then what next does the text say? When he had by himself purged our sins, then it says he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So what must that comprehend now? His ascension, right? Because he is now ascended back to be seated next to his father. So do you guys see that there is this linear sequence that is presented there where Christ is the appointed heir, then he's the co-creator, the one through or by whom God created, and then he's the one who purges our sins, that's his death at Calvary, and then he's the one who is ascended back to sit down at the right hand of his father, right? So you see this just dynamic picture of Christ as the heir of God, as the, the co-creator with God, as the one who lowers himself to purge our sins, and then the one who sends back to sit next to his father, right? So you see this picture of his work holistically, and verse 4 then tells us what this proves, right? It says that this proves him or this makes him better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. And that is a, a reference back to him as the appointed heir, right? Because the sequence started by saying he was God's appointed heir. And what we need to understand is that as being the appointed heir of God, the only begotten son, he actually has the very name of God. Turn with me in your Bibles to, I believe it's Exodus 23, verse 21. And to give you the context, this is God speaking to Moses, and he's talking about uh, the theophoric angel, that is the angel who is the Lord. This is the pre-incarnate Christ. And what uh, God was going to do for Israel through his son. And I'll, I'll actually read from verse 20. The scripture says, Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Do not provoke him, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. Did you, did you catch it? So God the Father is saying of this being, the Theophoric angel, that is the angel who is Christ, the messenger, right? He's saying, my name is in him. This is an Old Testament verse. So that ties back into what we're reading in Hebrews, where it says that he, by inheritance, has a more excellent name than the angels. That is because he has the very name of God, right? We could liken it to use an earthly illustration if there is, I'm a smith because my father is a smith. Now, we have different first names, as you saw in the <laughs> of this Zoom meeting, right? But if I had the exact same name as my father, 
I would have that name by my birthright, right? That's how I'm a Smith. But if I had the exact same name, then you'd call me a junior, right? Because it's the same name. Well, Christ, the Son of God, has the very name of his Father. That's why you'll read in the scripture that he's also called Yahweh, or some people prefer Jehovah, right? Because as the Son of God, he actually has the very name of his Father. And it's a more excellent name than any of the angels. You, Gabriel and all the rest of the hosts, they're not called. You can't call them Yahweh or Jehovah. They don't have that name. But the Son of God does. He has the very name of his father. And so we're seeing already kind of like this theme of superiority with the Son, right? Like he's just better. And angels are awesome. The, the rest of this chapter, we'll, we'll talk about them. They're marvelous, shiny, powerful beings, great personalities, wonderful, loving, right? They protect us. But when compared to Christ, the Son of God, I mean, it's, it's just like there's no comparison, right? So let's go back and, and look at, and by the way, this where, when the text says that he's the appointed heir, right? That's actually a reference back to something in the Old Testament in Proverbs 8, verses 22 to 30. When the Bible talks about, it uses wisdom to represent Christ and says that he was begotten or bought forth or set up. And this is why he is the heir of God, because he's the son that God brought forth. And so he is the heir of all things. The scripture, we could per perhaps look at that at another time. Now, jumping back up to verse 1, it says that God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son. Here we see another implicit superiority for Christ, right? So it was saying God in a variety of different ways and at different times, he was communicating to the fathers through the prophets. But now in these last days, meaning the Christian dispensation, he is giving communication. He's spoken through his son. Now, this is awesome because in the book of John, the book of John says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, right? Sister White comments on that, and she says, who is Christ? She says, Christ is the only begotten son of God, that he is like a word that expresses the thought, right? Like, y'all hear me speaking words right now. And, and these words are how we communicate. They're how we know each other. And over time, if enough words and time was spent, you could get a picture of my character, right? And you can't know me unless I communicate, unless I make myself uh, comprehensible somehow, some way, right? And words are typically how we do it. Well, who Christ is, as the Son of God, he is like a word that expresses the thought for the Father. He's like the communication of the Father's character. He makes God comprehensible to us, right? And so he, Hebrews is presenting him like as this pinnacle of divine communication, like, like just the highest level, like, oh, the prophets are great. The, the prophets are wonderful. God spoke to them in a variety of different ways and times, but now he's speaking in his son, who is his express image, the, the one who is just like him, like a chip off the old block, like the duplicate of who he is, right? And that is a really beautiful and wonderful thought to, to comprehend that we can know 
exactly who God is, what he is like in the person of his son, right? That if you see Jesus and you see how Jesus talks, you see how Jesus walks, you see what Jesus does, then you say, oh, that is what God the Father is like. And so there's this beautiful pinnacle of just the supreme communication coming to us in Christ, the express image of the Father's person. And so you can really see why he's so much better than the angels. Now, let's go back to the text and look at Hebrews chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Would anyone like to read verses 5 and 6? For unto which of the angels said he at any time, You are my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings in the first begotten of the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. Now, have you guys ever heard people say that if Christ was begotten, then that's the same thing as if he was created? Have any oh, of you yeah. ever, ever heard anyone say that? Yes, many times. Well, this is a verse that actually disproves that. Because if begotten and created were the same things, then you could say to an angel that the angel was begotten, couldn't you? Because isn't Gabriel a son by creation? Yes. Yeah. God created him. All the angels were created by God through his son. But there is only one being that God can ever say that being is his only begotten son. And that being, of course, is Christ. Now, the purpose of this verse is to show us the superiority of Christ in comparison to the angels. Because at no point in time ever did God say to an angel, you are begotten, right? Because they're not. All of the angels are created by God through Christ. There is only one being who is begotten of God. There's only one being that God can ever say, you are my only begotten son. And that being is Christ because he is the only son who has ever begotten. This is not really complicated, but amazingly, people today make it very complicated because of theological bias. But it's really not. And look at verse 6. It says, again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. Notice he's already the first begotten when he is brought into the world. And when that happens, God says to all of the angels that they should worship him. Now, why is that? The answer is because when Christ entered into this world, he actually took a much lower status. Okay? Angels are actually superior to mankind. The, the Bible teaches that in the book of Psalms. In fact, it's, it's even in the... Let's go, go to Hebrews chapter 2. And let's look at verse 6 and 7. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. But one testified in a certain place, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. Now, I'll stop there. And, and in fact, you actually can look at verse 9, and it says, we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels. So by Jesus becoming one of us, he actually entered into a status, a creaturely status, that is lower than the angels, right? Now, now, forgive me here, but I think that that must have been something that 
the fallen cherub must have been very excited about, right? Because his whole thing was he wanted to be equal to the most high. He wanted to usurp Jesus's place. And so when Jesus came down and entered into a status even lower than the angels, I'm sure Satan must have thought, ah, now's my time. I'm going to conquer him. I'm going to defeat him. I'm going to overthrow him because I'm now more powerful. But he was mistaken, right? Even in his weakness, in his humanity, Christ was stronger than the devil. Like, Christ is just amazing, right? But the, the point here is that he was made lower than the angels. And just, just think about that. You know, like, it's, we can't even find a way to really even grasp how much of a condescension this is just by him becoming one of us. We are dust. That's what we're made of. When we die, we turn into dust. We are finite, created beings, very limited. We are not even as strong and fast and powerful and beautiful as, as the angels who are spirit beings. But then like God himself and, and his son, who is of that same substance or material, who has an omnipresent ability, who can speak galaxies into existence, for him to become a dust preacher? Like, and of course he doesn't even stop there. He suffers and he dies for us. And remember, this is the character of God the Father too that Jesus is revealing. He's revealing what type of being his father is because he's the express image. He's just like his father in his character. He, he used to look just like him too, but then when he became one of us, he, he kind of covered that, that up. That. But this is just, it's wonderful to think of. And so God the Father gave this announcement at the time of the incarnation when his son came into the world. He, he made it clear, let all the angels worship him and i can imagine just the excitement of the angelic host you, you guys remember when the shepherds were out watching their flocks by night right and then the angel appeared to them and said fear not and then the whole heavenly host just exploded into the sky and started singing that they were so filled with joy to worship the son of god who had come on this marvelous rescue mission right to save us and we must worship him too because he's just good and if the angels worship christ we should worship him too we are the direct beneficiaries of his salvific work we are the sinners that his grace saves G gabriel doesn't need grace right we need grace and Jesus came to provide that for us. And the angels worship him for that too. In fact, that's another tie-in to the book of Revelation, isn't it? Right? They worship the, the lamb who has redeemed fallen mankind. All right. Let's go back to the text. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 7. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. I'm not really sure what that means. <laughs> like, I guess they, they might have some capabilities that we don't understand with the natural world. I, I mean, I, I've, I saw this story once, and forgive me, this is a tangent. But it was very interesting because uh, there was a woman driving, and the creek beneath the bridge had flooded up really high and she got into an accident and she drove her van off the creek off the bridge into the creek and it went down and some onlookers saw it and so they jumped into the water to rescue her and one man it was an african-american man he had swam down and he had felt all around the van and he couldn't get in because the doors were shut the windows were up he couldn't and he went all around the van so he came back up, went back down, and this time he found a window open and he was able to grab the woman 
and he pulled her through the window and up to the shore. And he was giving his story on a news interview. And as the camera person and the interview were there, they were pulling up the van from out of the water. And when they pulled the van out of the water, all the windows were still up. And they asked him, they said, how, how is this possible? How were you able to grab the woman and bring her up and all these windows are still up? And he said, I don't know. And I'm like, well, I know, you know, the angel of the Lord, the, the, the guardians that he sends, they can do these amazing things that there's a, they have capabilities that we don't understand and we don't know. In fact, even the fallen cherub, the scripture tells us that he caused all of the kingdoms of the world to appear before Jesus, didn't he? In glory. How'd he do that? The light bearer, maybe he projected it, I don't know, but there's these beings, they are awesome, they're powerful, they're strong. They're, he makes his angel spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. So they're great. Jewish tradition has a really strong emphasis on angels. If you look in some of the Jewish traditions, they name these seven chief angels, and there's a big focus and a, an obsession with them, which Hebrews is probably taking some of that for granted here, but it just keeps directing us back to say, hey, basically the angels are great, but the sun is even better, right? And that's what verse eight, says because it, it's saying God says this to the angels but to the son he says your throne O God is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness therefore God your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions or your fellows. And so while God speaks to the angels and says they're spirits and flames of fire, he speaks to his son and calls his son God, right? We should have no misgivings about the fact that the only begotten son of God is truly God in his nature. As the son of God, he must also be God in nature. I am the son of a man. I am a man in nature, right? So Christ, as the only begotten Son of God, is also God in his nature. And his Father says as much. If the Father says it, we should have no problem saying it either. And notice, it says a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. And now, if you'll give me a second, I, I want to actually just pull two quotes from the spirit of prophecy, because I just think they're great. This is from Youth Instructor, May 27th, 1897. Speaking of Christ, she says, he stepped down from the throne of honor, laid off his royal robe and his royal crown, gave back into his father's hand the scepter, and veiling divinity with humanity, humbled himself, and came to a world all seared and marred with the curse. Did you catch that part that it says about the scepter? What did he do? He gave back into his father's hand the scepter. So where did the scepter come from, right? It must have come from the father's hand, right? In, in order to give back into the father's hand, the father's hand must have given the scepter. There's another quote, and I'm going to see if I can find it, because it is, oh yeah, here it is. This I love this one. This is manuscript number one, 1899, paragraph 49. It says, after Christ came up from the resurrection, what did he do? He grasped his power and held his scepter. He opened the graves and brought up the multitudes of captives, testifying to everyone in our world and in creation that he had the power over death and that he rescued the captives of death. 
Oh, I love that. I love that, guys. I, I always used to think that uh, when Jesus came down, he gave back the scepter and he didn't take it back up until after he ascended and was re-glorified with the Father. But this quote appears to suggest that he took the scepter right when he resurrected and he used his power right as the co-regent with god to raise up a group of people from the dead right then and said i have the power over death and the grave now oh, that oh come on y'all that that is so exciting this that's so great we're, we're talking about the superiority of the son of god right that all the power that the father has, he says, I gave it right to my son, and I want him to use that power for us, right? My Bible tells me that as the father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the son to have life in himself, right? And that is the reason why Jesus explains in John 5, 26, that his voice says the son of God will raise the dead. So, and, and I'm getting so ahead of myself, because that's what Hebrews 2 talks about, right? It says that Christ came to set us free from the devil who had the power of death and who was using that to make us afraid and to keep us in bondage. You know, if you're following Christ, oh, the devil will do everything to throw you off track. He'll try to deceive you. He'll try to bribe you, right? But when push comes to shove, the last card that the devil will play, if he can't get you in any other way, he says, I will persecute you. I will kill you. And Jesus is saying, do not be afraid even of death because I have the power over it. Right? He took back up his scepter. And, and anyway... And so the, the scripture continues on. It says, you've loved righteousness. We're back in Hebrews 1 now, verse 9. And hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Yes, brother. Yeah, well, going back to what you were talking about with the power and him being given the scepter and then taking it back. Before he ascended, he told the disciples, all power is given to me. Yes. I give it to you. So, you know, that that too shows that, you know, it's given to him of the Father. So, I mean, that, that just goes right along with what you're saying. And that's the verse that was coming to my mind. Amen. I agree. The scripture interprets the scripture. Mm -hmm. And the the text there says that God has anointed Christ. Well, there is, if you go back into Proverbs chapter 8, and I believe it's going to be verse 23, you'll actually see that Christ is the anointed. Uh, the King James might say set up or established. I would have to, uh, to look at the King James, but... The Hebrew word there is nasak, and it, it can really mean to anoint or to pour out. And I'm going to read to you something from letter 256, 1906. And it's very much related to what we're looking at here in Hebrews 1, where we're comparing the sun to the angels, right? It says, the father wrought by his son in the creation of all heavenly beings. By him were all things created, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, Colossians 1.16. Angels are God's ministers, radiant with the light ever flowing from his presence and speeding on rapid wing to execute his will. But the Son, the anointed of God, the express image of his person, the brightness of his glory, upholding all things by the word of his power, holds supremacy over them all. Hebrews 1.3. A glorious high throne from the beginning was the place of his sanctuary, a scepter of righteousness, the scepter of his kingdom. 
Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Mercy and truth go before his face. So Christ was the anointed of God. And do you know that when he came to become one of us, he actually emptied himself? It's what Philippians 2 talks about. Christ emptied himself and he came to become one of us and then received the anointing of God's spirit again for us to reconnect the human race into the spirit of God, into the life of God, to give that back to our race. He, he came to be our new Adam. And this is just a marvelous, marvelous truth. Anyway, let's keep reading with, we'll finish Hebrews chapter one, and then we'll, we'll close off for today. We're in verse 10 now. The Bible says, and you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain, and they will all grow old like a garment. Like a cloak, you will fold them up, and they will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will not fail. Now, that's going to become very, very good news later on in this book, because we're going to see about how Jesus is the high priest. And did you guys know that if you go back and read in the Torah, that whenever there was a high priest, you were covered during the lifetime of that high priest. So, for example, if you had fled to one of the cities of refuge, you were, you were covered during the life of that high priest. And the atonement that high priest made for you was good so long as that high priest was alive. But when he would die, then you'd have to do the whole thing over again, right? That's why they kept continually doing it over and over. That's part of the reason. Well, Jesus, his years will never fail. So if you're covered by him as your high priest, then guess what? You are forever covered. Forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. Right? So this is excellent. Excellent, excellent news for us that this is the guy that's that's become our high priest. And verse 13, and that we're going back to the theme of contrasting uh, Christ with the angels. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? And again, that has never been said to any of the angels. Are they not all ministering spirits? sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation. So the angels of God are sent to help us. They are actually working to bring us into a position and a closeness with God that is even greater and higher than what they themselves have. And they have great joy in doing this. They're unselfish beings because they're filled with the love of God in Christ, right? And as great as they are, they just don't compare to the Son of God. So this is the first chapter of Hebrews, which is establishing the superiority of the Son of God in comparison to the angels, right? And so this is our first point of encouragement as we start in our book of Hebrews. We're dealing with somebody. We're dealing with a being that is just the greatest of the great that the best of the best, that, and this is our guy, our friend, our savior, our king, our brother, right? That's who he is. And we rejoice and we thank God for that. And then we're going to go through and start seeing all the excellent things that Jesus is doing uh, for us, so that he has done and that he is doing uh, through, throughout the book of Hebrews. All right. Well, that's it for now, brothers and sisters. I, mm -hmm. I want you to just meditate throughout this next time period until we can we can meet again and move forward to Hebrews 2. Just remember that Jesus, the greatness of Christ, right? And that he's the one 
who lowered himself to become one of us, to be our friend and our brother and our savior. And if you can think of that, how great he is, you know, it'll really help you as you face the struggles to know that guy, he has your back, you know, the son of God, the son of man is the one for us. So remember him throughout this time as, as we move forward and we'll start looking at uh, Hebrews 2 next time. That's it, I guess. Sister Deborah, you unmuted. Did you have something you wanted to say? Yes, I just wanted to thank Brother Jason for unpacking it with exuberant love himself for the book and for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And verses that I've read, I think he unpacked them in ways by references to spirit of prophecy and other parts of scripture that were very enlightening. So it's been an excellent study. Thank you. Hey, praise the Lord. Do you want to go ahead and have a closing prayer? C certainly. Let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, we come to you in the name of your son, Jesus. The name above all names. The name that is actually on equal footing with you yourself. The name that touches you in infinity. And we rejoice in this because that means that we can be fully reconciled to you through that name, through the name of your son, Jesus. That there is no sin, Father, that he cannot grant us grace for, Lord, if we will truly confess it. That there is no problem that he cannot remedy, Lord, that everything is in his hands. You trust him and we trust him as well. He has told us in the word that if we believe in you, we should also believe in him because there are many rooms in your house and he has gone there to prepare a place for us. Lord, we thank you for his superiority, that we know he is perfect in all things and his perfection can help our imperfection. His sinlessness can cover for our sinfulness and his spirit can empower us and it can encourage us and it can help us all the way through. Lord, we ask in his name that you would forgive us for our sins, that you would help us again through his name by giving us of your Holy Spirit, that we can live more for you, that we can love him more completely, that we can share him with others more effectively, and that we can be as lights in this world because that is the mission that he has left us with. Lord, as we continue in your word, we pray that you would make it a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We love you, and we ask that you accept and answer this prayer in the mighty and precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.